Welcome, everybody. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Peter Asaro. He, well, you see from his, um, the, the bottom half of the slide here, which NASCAR style shows his various affiliations. Um, but the important, most important ones for our purposes, first, he is um, a, uh, a visiting fellow here at CITP um, at present. Second, he is um, uh, on the faculty at the New School in the Media Studies Department. And third, he's co-founder of the International Committee for Robot Arms Control. So anybody who can say all of those things um, has to be an interesting speaker. And we're, uh, I'm looking forward to hearing Peter talk about what we can do about robots and how we can, how we can keep them from taking over the world. <laughs> if we're lucky, yes. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, today I'm going to talk a bit about some projects I've been working on and, and really kind of lay some groundwork for what's going to hopefully be a future project that will be a book uh, or uh, several books perhaps, um, looking at how do we really create policies for regulating robots in society. And um, I just kind of want to give a little background to this, like why, why should we be so concerned about robots? And way back in 2007, Bill Gates was already saying that we're at the dawn of the robot revolution. And really this kind of last sentence of this quote is, uh, we may be on the verge of a new era when the PC will get up off the desk and allow us to see, touch, hear, and manipulate objects in places where we are not physically present. And he really sees it as being very much like the PC revolution uh, in the 70s, and that we're really at that moment where you know people are still building this stuff in garages, and there's a few companies looking at marketing, some kind of large mainframey type things. but. What we're going to see is the proliferation of these systems very rapidly. And, and since 2007, we really have seen a lot of innovation of technology and a lot of uh, deployment of these technologies. Um, in the last year, we've also seen really a pivot amongst all of the giants of internet technology towards robotic systems from Amazon's project and delivery drones. Uh, Facebook acquired Titan Aerospace, this drone company. Uh, and Google, most actively, of course, they're best known for their self-driving cars. But uh, early last year, uh, they acquired eight robotics companies in a very quiet fashion, um, but really very significant ones, including Boston Dynamics that makes these sort of horse and dog and cat-like robots that you've probably seen videos of. Um, they just released a new one, Shaft Robotics, which is a spinoff of the to University of Tokyo uh, and does some really incredible manipulation and grasping, and they actually won the DARPA challenge last year. Um, um, Bot and Dolly, one of my favorite robot companies, they make robotic dollies for filmmaking, and they did a lot of the special effects for gravity, uh, things like that. Uh, Holomini, which makes these omnidirectional wheels and systems for uh, robots in factories or, or in warehouses, things like that. Um, a bunch of others, including things that unload and load trucks. Uh, and DeepMind, which is an AI company that does deep learning. I'll talk a bit about that later. Um, so this, this sort of trend is what I call Robots as Media, which is a seminar I've been teaching for the last few years at the new school. And robots, to my mind, is a very broad category of anything that really senses, computes, and actuates. Um, and so in some trivial sense, every computer sort of does that, but most of its actuation is just limited to a screen maybe a printer or something that's hooked up to it. But what we're really looking at is sophisticated actuation mechatronics that are com combined with this computation and sens senses, and which can be all range of different kinds of sensors. And, and, and these can be very highly distributed systems. They can be teleoperated by human controllers. They can be autonomous. Uh, they can be mobile. They can be fixed arms, wheels, all sorts of different things. Um, and what it really is more generally as a phenomenon is, is information and communication technology invading physical space. So they have always had a physical substrate and they needed physical infrastructure, but now they're out in the world. And ideas around ubiquitous computing, ambient intelligence, telepresence, hybrid reality systems, the Internet of Things, have been kind of bouncing these ideas around. But we're really at the stage now where the robotics technology itself has caught up and we're actually able to realize a lot of these uh, systems. And it's happening very rapidly. And you know we typically call these mobile communications devices, but they're not actually all that mobile, right? We have to carry them around. They don't move on their own. And robots are really going to move on their own. And I think it, just to kind of illustrate this example, we can look at a very simple drone. This is the Parrot AR drone that you can get on Amazon for 200 bucks. 
Um, and it's a quad rotor. And quad rotors have existed for a long time, but they're extremely difficult to fly. But now they basically fly themselves. And why is that? Well, it's because of a combination of different technologies. So one thing is you take it out of the box. It doesn't have a remote control. You download an app, and you're flying it with your smartphone or your tablet as your controller. It's using a Wi-Fi, so it creates its own kind of Wi-Fi router, and you're connecting your device to its Wi-Fi router for the linkage. So it's using a lot of this ICT technology. Some of them use Bluetooth. But more interestingly, to actually get this thing to become stable, you need gyroscopes. And you need very small, very lightweight gyroscopes. And those were basically in either too expensive or technically infeasible even five years ago. But because of these things, which all have gyros in them, essentially motion sensors that let you do the tilt and everything, um, you can buy those for five cents a piece now and drop them into these essentially toys. And that's why you can actually fly quad rotors. And that's why we've seen this explosion of the technology, because it's become so cheap because of the way that consumer electronics has driven the innovation around these things. So, so uh, these are also sort of indications of how this revolution is going to sort of move very quickly. And we're really at the cusp of, of this kind of robotics revolution. So the question or the problem that I'm trying to get at is how can society guide the development and use of this technology towards uh, broadly construed social values, safety, privacy, justice, um, whatever we, you know, we feel is important as a society to ensure that this technology does. And, Kind of in retrospect, there's a lot of things we might have wished computer technology would have a better uh, grasp of these social values before a lot of large systems have been implemented. So what can we learn from the ICT revolution that we can apply to the robotics revolution? Um, and so these kind of foundational questions of you know, how do we determine what values and policies should be implemented? How do we get the technology to conform to these values and policies? What kinds of authorities should be responsible for you know, enforcement of policies and regulations? How do we do all this without stifling innovation? Uh, and how do we do all this without really knowing the full extent of the capabilities and applications that these technologies are going to go to? So I think this is a kind of philosophically fundamental problem, but we can try to get at it in some practical ways as well. Uh, and we can look to the kinds of approaches that have been used so far. And if we look at techno robotics technology that's already out there, so industrial robots have been around for a long time, and there's been you know, safety regulations, and these are promulgated by like, the International Standards Organization, which has just recently come up with similar standards now for surgical robots and also uh, healthcare robots, which are sort of more nursing styles, which turn out to be different bodies within the ISO that regulate those. But that's things like that they can be sterilized and um, that they have certain kinds of fault tolerances and things like that. There's various, of course, application domains for robots. Robots can be used for all kinds of things. And really the kind of forefront of this revolution has started with manufacturing. That's been around for a few decades. Uh, the, the surgical robots have, have been quite successful in the last few years, and now it's the drones are kind of leading the charge with self-driving cars kind of right behind them. And we've seen some of the personal robots. The Roombas have been around for a while as kind of simple home devices, and now the Jibo is this kind of social interactive system that doesn't really move around too much. And that's kind of the more complicated wave. So as you get more and more into the social world, that environment that the system has to operate in gets a lot more complicated. Industrial robots, most of the standards are things like leave it in a cage, don't let anybody go in there and have all kinds of crazy buttons and lights that go on when you open the door so that it doesn't crush people by accident, basically. Uh, but now when you're talking about interacting face to face or you know sharing physical space with robots, different standards have to apply. And then you start talking about sharing information. So this thing is going to go to the store and do shopping for you as a kind of personal assistant. Now it has access to your credit card information, and it's making purchases on your behalf, and it uh, maybe has all kinds of private personal information that it's recording about you in your home. Uh, and who controls that? And these kinds of questions uh, are going to become much more complicated as, as they move into these more sophisticated environments. Uh, the flying ones, of course, fall under FAA jurisdiction. Uh, Self-driving cars under the National Highway Traffic Safety, medical robots can fall under some of the FDA requirements. Um, 
FCC because they're all communications. Ryan Callow, who's a law professor at Washington and organizes the Weave Robot Conference, has suggested that we should have, or p potentially might want to have, a new federal regulatory agency for robots, in specifically. Um, so there's a kind of question what that might look like. Um, a lot of my work on the robot arms control stuff has been at the international level, where you have completely different kinds of uh, bodies, so treaty organizations, the United Nations, uh, and then we can also kind of look to internet governance and ICANN and things like that. And then we also have all the state and local uh, regulations, which I'll talk briefly about with drones, but it gets really crazy. Everybody comes up with their own rules. Um, and, and as I've written about with telepresence and teleagency, as you can operate these things from different jurisdictions, so you don't have to be where the robot is, it creates a lot of interesting kinds of problems. So this came up a lot with the World Trade Organization and some gambling restrictions. So states in the US that wanted to restrict gambling, but offshore accounts, and I think it was Aruba, were allowing uh, people to gamble there. And is the gambling happening where the server is? Is it happening where people are gambling from? Who has regulatory authority over that? And, and the Aruba successfully sued the US to allow people to gamble online from their servers. Um, so some of these questions come up with robotics and other ways. So who can hunt where? Uh, what happens when you commit crimes across these different jurisdictional territories? Um, and of course, there's a whole tradition, which is kind of where I come from, of thinking about social values within the design process of information technology systems and also robotic systems. And there's been a lot of interest in this within the human-robot interaction community. How do you design robots that are you know, polite and courteous but can also pick up on social cues? Uh, but also, how do you make these safe? And so we have user-centered design, value-centered design, human-centered design, participatory design, and a, a kind of broader notion of this kind of multi-stakeholder governance. So how do we actually get communities uh, and affected people, because everybody's going to be affected by these technologies, involved in this kind of process. So I want to talk sort of quickly, because I don't have a lot of time, but basically cover three cases um, that take rather different approaches to regulation, and then try to draw some conclusions and generalizations about that. So I'm going to look at deep learning and superintelligence, and this is the, the deep mind stuff I was talking about. Um, and then some the small UAS drones and the FAA regulations that have been developed around that are in the process. And then my own work on the autonomous lethal weapons systems and a kind of international treaty framework. Uh, so Google DeepMind. So DeepMind is a British uh, artificial intelligence machine learning company that uses deep learning. And deep learning is kind of a fancy word for combining two older versions of computer uh, machine learning. So unsupervised learning and supervised learning. Unsupervised learning doesn't need data to be explicitly tagged or have a human tell it when it gets right or wrong answers. It's basically clustering algorithms. Uh, where supervised learning is you say, OK, these are all examples of x, and these are all examples of y. Now learn a rule that distinguishes x from y. But what you can do with deep learning is combine these. So you can use these huge big data databases of untagged data or sometimes tagged data. But it'll start by clustering that information itself and creating its own categories and concepts, and then learn rules for how the behavior operates in that. That's kind of the, the rough example of it. But it's, it's been pretty effective at uh, doing some things like identifying pictures of cats on the internet. Um, <clears throat> and more recently, learning how to play the video game Breakout uh, sort of on its own and coming up with optimal strategies fairly uh, efficiently. Um, so there's a concern there that this is a pathway towards what's been called for a while super intelligence, which would be basically greater than human level intelligence, uh, and certain kinds of th threats that may emanate from that. And I think automation in general, and increasingly with artificial intelligence automation, the displacement of labor from the workplace. So we can replace factory workers with robots, but now we can also replace middle managers and more of the intellectual workers uh, with professors, right, uh, with robots, right, and what, or AIs. Um, so what's that going to mean for, for social transformation? So things like guaranteed incomes uh, are going to become necessary because there's just not going to be any jobs that are economically viable anymore for people to have. Um, and then there's this sort of larger existential questions about the loss of human control, uh, 
over specific kinds of processes. So we're already seeing this in the stock market where most of the trades now are all done um, by robots and software agents. 20% uh, of the, something, is that right? Of those are now done by what are essentially AIs that are unsupervised, uh, that are just let loose on their own. And there was a stock market crash in 2010, the flash crash, where these systems kind of got into a downward spiral and the stock market lost 24% of its value in one day. They had to shut it down and actually roll it back. And that was a bit of chaos. So there's those kinds of things. And then there's now been a bunch of high level uh, kind of internet uh, visionaries who are warning about the kind of existential threats that these might pose. Um, so Stephen Hawking, Bill Gates, Steve Wozniak, just this week, Bill Gates and Steve Wozniak came out. Stephen Hawking a couple months ago. Uh, and there was this meeting of the Future of Life Institute, which is kind of Silicon Valley think tank that's concerned about these issues uh, that they had in January. And they produced a letter uh, with some priorities for thinking about you know, how do we develop this uh, going forward. And this was authored by Eric Horvitz, Stuart Russell, Elon Musk, the guys from DeepMind, um, and people who were at this meeting. And basically what they're saying is, okay, we, we were sort of skeptical about how effective AI could be for a long time. Now we actually see that there are pathways where it could become very powerful. But how do we regulate that? How do we know sort of what AIs are going to like jump out of the box? Uh, how do you do responsible development in this area when there's potentially a lot of value that can come from developing this kind of technology? Uh, and so what DeepMind did when they were acquired by Google last year was insist on the creation of an internal ethics board within Google that would kind of oversee and regulate their own activities uh, within that. And, and that has been sort of created, a, on paper anyway. Uh, I don't know to what extent there is actually a group of people who are operating in that capacity yet. Uh, but they should be there eventually. And they're mostly focused on the AI side of Google's business. But it's sort of central to their whole enterprise. Um, and this is really kind of based on a tradition of engineering ethics and codes of ethics. And it's like, so how can we kind of do design in this way? Ra rather than some external regulatory framework or some clear set of rules. Um, and the idea is that they're going to kind of police themselves. And it's a tricky area because a lot of this is highly proprietary information. So they don't want to share it with anybody. They wouldn't want regulators coming in and expect, inspecting their algorithms. Uh, and it's not clear that there would be any kind of agency that would have the expertise actually necessary to understand what these systems are capable of doing or how they operate. And it's not clear that as systems become self-learning and self-changing, whether even the engineers who design them are going to really understand what they're going to be capable of or you know, what the potential risks and hazards are. So, so that's one kind of model is this kind of self-regulation. It's, it's based a lot on the bio life sciences and bioethics notion that you'll have some ethics review boards that make sure what you're doing is, is kind of on the up and up. Um, but there's not a lot of explicit regulation. Um, unmanned aerial vehicles or unmanned aerial systems or drones uh, have been a hot, an increasingly hot topic over the last few years. Uh, and these are not the military style ones. I'm looking at the commercial and domestic applications of these within the national aerospace of the US primarily. And every country is sort of dealing with them a little bit differently. Uh, but since 1981, the FAA had a set of rules that was called an advisory circular for basically model airplane flyers that said, you know, don't fly around airports, stay below 400 feet, uh, under 55 pounds, things like that. Um, and they've been operating under that for several decades without a lot of problems. Um, and then in 2007, they kind of issued this prohibition on commercial use, uh, which is kind of an odd category. So what's, wh why does it matter much, one might think, whether one's flying a small aircraft and selling the pictures later or not. The sort of risk factors are inherent in whether it's flying and being flown safely. Um, but they, they tried this. And there's actually a case, uh, the Ralph Perker case, where he was shot a video for the University of Virginia uh, and was charged uh, with a violation by the FAA and a $10,000 fine. And it went to a federal court uh, for administrative law. And they said, no, 
the FAA can't impose that rule because they actually didn't go through the proper rulemaking process to issue this rule back in 2007. Uh, so FAA appealed it, and then it got settled out of court. Um, but they kind of realized they could uh, like lose their whole <laughs> regulatory structure, so they kind of backed off, I guess. Um, and then they imposed a, a unmanned systems licensing model for a few years that was basically just open to government agencies, NASA, the Department of Defense, uh, meteorology, things like that, NOAA. Uh, and then under the FAA Modernization Reform Act 2012, they were sort of required by Congress to create rules to govern these unmanned aerial systems. So since then, they've been trying to figure out how to do that. And they just issued uh, last month their uh, notice of proposed rulemaking. So it's a big stack of proposed rules. Uh, the basics are similar to what the old uh, our remote control plane requirements were, which is you have to have line of sight, visual contact of the aircraft, have to stay below 500 feet, has to be under 55 pounds, um, can't go more than 100 miles an hour, can't be near airports or certain restricted airspaces, um, things like that. But at the same time, they have put in this commercial use clause, uh, which is new. It creates it as a category. And it's not clear under that where academic work falls. Is that commercial? Because you're a university who's getting paid to teach classes. Uh, similarly for education, uh, research, uh, whether that's you know commercial research or academic research. So these categories are all also very weird. And the FAA in the last couple of weeks has started issuing warnings to people who've posted drone videos to YouTube, saying that that's commercial use because you can generate ad revenue, so which would basically shut down everything, <laughs> right? So if you can't put up your videos, and there's about, oh, there's thousands of these videos online already. Um, so, and just ahead of that, the, there was a presidential executive order issued on government use of unmanned aerial systems. So, so the kind of the big problems with the FAA rulemaking is, so the, for the large drones, and these are 55 pounds, so those can't fly over people. Uh, but of course, these little drones fly over people all the time. So there's some, they're already kind of acknowledging that, and they're talking about creating a micro category that would be under five pounds, and those would be allowed to fly over people. The other thing is a lot of hobbyists are in, into what's called FPV, first person uh, vision. So you actually put a camera inside the plane, and you're flying with goggles as if you're inside the remote control plane, and that's currently illegal, unless you have an external spotter uh, and these other kinds of requirements. Um, but those things, you can have miles of range, and um, so they're gonna have to figure out how to deal with that. And really the kind of the 800 pound gorilla is privacy. And that's really what most people are concerned with. Uh, and it's basically completely ignored by the FAA. Uh, and, and their claim from the beginning is that that's not their expertise. They're into safety, uh, protecting aircraft, protecting people on the ground. Uh, privacy isn't part of that. But there's also no other agency that really has that kind of jurisdictional power, so who's going to do that? So in many ways, the presidential executive order was a sort of preemptive move by the administration to, to put something in place about privacy, although it only applies to government agencies. And it mostly focuses on they have to have you know a use of any of these UAVs that's part of their job, whatever agency it is. There's, there has to be a reason for collecting the data if they collect data. Uh, if that data contains any personally identifiable information, they have to have policies in place for handling it, which includes uh, destroying it after 180 days unless they have good reasons to keep it, um, ensuring that it's secure, uh, all sorts of things like that. And, and then there's questions about transferring it between agencies. Um, but as soon as you get into the law enforcement realm, of course, there's all kinds with the Patriot Act. There's all kinds of ways for this information to move around. Um, so it's not clear exactly what, uh, how that's going to work out. But none of this, of course, applies to commercial uh, use or private use and the ability of people to collect all kinds of information. So. That's really scary because if you think, 
I mean, we've already given up so much privacy online and, and through our different kinds of communication devices, but generally that happens because we are engaging in end user license agreements. We are operating uh, other people's software or other people's networks uh, so that we've in, engaged in some kind of contractual relationship with these agencies, right? But with robots and drones and things, these are wandering around in public space. And so many of the people that they're engaging with or filming have not signed anything. They're, they're not under any end user license agreement. So, so it transforms really public space in a kind of fundamental way. If these things can record our activities uh, and, and archive that. Uh, so, you know, Google Street View drives around and takes pictures of where everybody lives, but uh, it's only doing that infrequently. But if these things can fly all the time, um, and be somewhat persistent, or they can be linked together using large data techniques. Effectively, you'll be recorded and documented all the time, everywhere, or potentially. Uh, and so, your you know expectations of privacy in public space will be radically transformed by that, uh, potentially. Uh, and so, people are really freaked out about this. And so, there's been a lot of activity in, in state and local governments around drones. The first ones were in Virginia, where they were focused more on government and making sure that you had warrants if the police were ever going to use a drone to film somebody or follow somebody. Um, others kind of pro prohibiting the use of drones for hunting. Um, others actually issuing hunting licenses for drones. Uh, and some states saying that it's also permissible to shoot down drones over your property. Uh, and, and this gets into a lot of really interesting questions about property rights. And, and actually, when the FAA was created, part of the purpose was prior to that, you actually had property rights, um, as they used to say in English law, from heaven to hell, right, around your boundaries. So your property rights extended all the way up and all the way down. Um, of course, you can sell mineral rights below, but your air rights. Um, and basically, the FAA was a federal law that said nobody has air rights anymore. Otherwise. If you wanted to fly a plane across the country, you'd have to get permission from every landowner between each coast that you were going to fly over. And that's totally impractical. So they created the federal airspace. Um, but now there's this question of kind of what's that 500 feet above the ground, uh, and who owns that, and at what point is it private or not private, or what they call in privacy law curtilage, which is that area right around your house that's super private where you do your sunbathing and things like that. Um, so there's a whole kind of history of Fourth Amendment law around this and the reasonable expectations of privacy, which has this test for subjective expectation of privacy, but coupled with an objective uh, test of whether that's a reasonable expectation of privacy, which has been interpreted by the Supreme Court in various ways. But essentially, if a technology is publicly available, uh, then you don't, you no longer have a sort of reasonable expectation that you're not going to, it's not going to be used against you. Uh, so in cases of, say, using thermal imagery to detect people growing marijuana in their basements, it was decided that this is not a common technology and the police used it and these people did have a reasonable expectation of privacy. Um, <clears throat> now, if it becomes the case that every cell phone has thermal imagery in it, that Supreme Court test now says, well, you don't have a reasonable expectation that people aren't going to see the heat signature coming out of your basement because everybody carries thermal imagery around. Uh, and similarly with drones, right? And actually, the cases that have involved helicopters, and they're mostly about growing marijuana in backyards or greenhouses. So they fly over, and they see over the fence, or they see in the greenhouse. And, and it's basically, they consider airspace public space. Um, and they call it the navigable airspace, which for airplanes is, is a significant altitude. But actually, under FAA rules, helicopters, because they can land almost anywhere, as long as they're not running into power lines and buildings and towers, the navigable airspace is down to the ground. So it's, there's already precedent for the drones are sort of always in public space. Um, this runs up against local laws, peeping Tom laws, stalking laws, paparazzi laws that do give certain kinds of protections against uh, invasive recording. Um, but of course, these vary state to state as well. There's also a range of First Amendment issues that come up in which the presidential executive order also addresses, which is civil liberties and civil rights, which is 
your freedom of assembly and your freedom of association are impacted if people are able to record all of your meetings, right, and follow you around and things like that. So it's not simply about um, public-private space or the search and seizure rules of the police to be able to search you. Um, and so where we're at now is, is actually this week, the NTIA just issued their multi-stakeholder process announcement. So there'll be a 60-day period uh, for you to submit any statements that you'd like, um, which would, uh, which is kind of an interesting because there are then these mechanisms for trying to get public discussion uh, and civil society involved in the uh, discussion. Um, but mostly the discussions taking place between you know federal agencies, uh, large companies, and the, some of these large consumer groups uh, that are uh, lobbyists essentially. Um, so there's a consortium of all of the UAVs groups within the government uh, that are operating in this space. Uh, but there aren't really a lot of kind of grassroots groups. Uh, most of these are people who want to make money off of this. They're, they're commercially interested groups. And then the, the model airplane is probably the most uh, vocal of the kind of public grassroots groups. Um, Okay, so that's kind of where we're standing with that. And then I want to talk a little bit about the campaign to stop killer robots at a, at a very different scale, the international scale, and just a kind of history of that. So, so this is a non-governmental organization that I co-founded in 2009 um, with just four people uh, initially. And basically we just wanted to initiate some kind of global discussion about what does it mean to allow fully autonomous lethal weapons, uh, and shouldn't we have a public discussion about that before these things uh, are actually designed and, and used? And then in April of 2013, the Campaign to Stop Killer Robots was formed, which is a coalition of NGOs, uh, of which we're one of the steering committee, along with Human Rights Watch, Nobel Women's Initiative, Minds Action Canada, uh, Pugwash International, um, WILF, the Women's International League of Peace and Freedom, and PAX, which is a Dutch peace organization, and AAR, which is a Japanese aid and relief um, organization. So really trying to focus on the United Nations and mechanisms within that. And many of the participants in this uh, have experience from the landmine prohibition and the cluster munition prohibition and following roughly the same model there and kind of right after that there was also a report to the UN Human Rights Council from the Special Rapporteur for Extrajudicial and Summary Execution, Christoph Hines, that was a long kind of study of fully autonomous weapons and the threats they may pose to human rights. Um, and the Human Rights Council didn't want to deal with it and they generally don't want to deal with arms control issues. Uh, so we were referred to the CCW, which is the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons, which is a convention that was signed in the early 80s and went into force. It's basically designed to regulate different kinds of conventional weapons, which are not biological, chemical, nuclear, things like that. And it's a standing body that is kind of open to amendment at any time, and they have annual meetings. And um, they've at different times addressed cluster munitions and landmines, uh, and most recently uh, blinding lasers. And they actually issued a preemptive prohibition on blinding lasers, uh, permanently blinding lasers in the late 90s. Um, and they called for an expert meeting uh, that occurred last spring, uh, and then a second one that's going to happen in a couple, three weeks uh, in April of this year. Um, and so basically it's four or five days of meetings and they bring together different people to discuss it and it's in a kind of framework. They're not talking about a treaty explicitly. They're still in the stage of deciding whether they should try to build a treaty around this or not. Uh, with clusters and landmines, this process went on for many, many years and eventually got nowhere and so they went to what's called an outside process. So the Ottawa process and the Oslo process where the government of Norway and the government of Canada sponsored a treaty and they just got enough signatures from countries that it became its, its own treaty organization uh, without being really part of the CCW. Um, so there's been a lot of discussion there and let me just kind of define what do we mean by a 
autonomous weapon system. So that's my preferred parlance. Uh, the UN's actually been using lethal autonomous weapon system, but then the acronym is LAWS. So you're talking about laws for laws, and it gets really confusing, so I don't like that one. Uh, other people call them FAWS, fully autonomous weapons. And of course, the campaign likes killer robots, and that works really well for the media. Um, but they're really all kind of the same thing. And what we're talking about is this, you might have also heard this sort of humans in the loop, uh, humans out of the loop, and then there's this kind of humans on the loop or near the loop, or right? So they kind of all, a lot of fuzziness uh, in this concept. But it's basically whether a human is in kind of direct control of certain processes. And so in the US Air Force, they have what they call a decision cycle or a kill chain, where for any given target, you find it, you fix it, you track it, and then you target it, which means you actually arm and aim a weapon at it. Uh, and then you engage it, which means you pull the trigger or fire the weapon, and then you assess like what happened after. And so really it's this targeting and engagement, those two steps. If those are automated and there's no human who's supervising that, authorizing that, approving that, um, then it's an autonomous weapon system. Um, and so the counter to that and where a lot of the discussions will be focused on this April is how do you ensure meaningful human control and what constitutes meaningful human control over targeting and engagement decisions. Um, and, and I can talk more about that, but I think it's, a, it's interesting because it's not simple human control because you could just have a light that turned on and then a person presses a button and technically the human is doing it, but they have no information about what, what's the target. Is that a valid target? Do I need to destroy it? Is there a military necessity for that? Is it proportionate, discriminate, and so forth? Uh, so it has to be meaningful at some level. And control also implies responsibility and accountability uh, and these kinds of things. So in the spectrum of actual current weapons, there's a number of weapons that have some degree of autonomy. These are typically anti-missile systems. So the Patriot missile system, uh, and the phalanx system are both designed to shoot down incoming missiles. The phalanx uses a radar and a Gatling gun to shoot down missiles coming at a ship. Uh, and the Patriot uses radar and a missiles to shoot down other missiles that are coming at, say, a, an Air Force base. Um, and it's it made mistakes. It shoots down friendly aircraft sometimes and things like that. Uh, the first generation of cruise missiles that the Navy developed are called over-the-horizon cruise missiles. So they would actually fly beyond visual range, can the curvature of the Earth was such that you couldn't get a radar signal of an enemy ship, but you'd shoot this missile, and when it gets over the horizon, its radar can see the ship, and then it's gonna hit it, but you actually don't have a positive identification of the target. What's interesting about those is they're, one, that they're no longer used, but they're no longer used by the US military because nobody ever used them. No commander ever found themselves in the situation where they were like comfortable enough to shoot a missile off into a distance that they couldn't see and expect it to hit something that it, they wanted it to hit uh, and to be responsible for whatever it did hit. Um, and more recently, we've seen uh, along the demilitarized zone in Korea, there's a Samsung Techwin system um, called the SRG, Century Gun, which basically um, is a robotic gun turret that uses computer vision systems to see human forms and it can use infrared and it just shoots a machine gun at them. Um, and so their claim is that it's similar enough to a landmine and there's landmines there and they feel that they're not uh, beholden to the international ban on landmines because it's still an active war zone from the 1950s. Um, so, but they also claim that they leave it in a supervised mode so that there's humans who actually have to press the, the button to fire the guns. Uh, and then we've seen a, the new wave of, of military drones that are in development. This is the British Tyrannus that I put up there, the other uh, X-47B that the US is developing. And these are fully autonomous uh, attack drones, combat drones, which carry large amounts of ordnance. Uh, and it's not clear from their descriptions in the brochures whether they're capable of autonomous targeting and engagement. Um, they're they could be given lists of targets and then they fly off and attack those targets. But if they are engaging in say air-to-air -air combat or looking for criteria-based targeting, 
of say, this is, looks like an air base to me, or that looks like a ship to me, I'm gonna shoot a missile at it or drop a bomb on it. Um, they could be very easily uh, turned into autonomous weapon systems. And these are you know, five to maybe 10 years away from being combat ready or fielded. Um, and they're already capable of taking off and landing fully autonomously from aircraft carriers and things like that. Um, so why, why would we want to ban these? And, and this is more advocacy than, uh, than simply uh, observing what's happening in the arena. But um, really, I mean, ultimately, it's, it comes down to the risk to civilians and, and civil infrastructure. And you know, under humanitarian law, you have responsibility to protect civilians. Can you ensure that when these systems are fully autonomous? Um, those who are proponents of these say, well, of course, we do weapons reviews. We would never release a weapon that was indiscriminate or disproportionate. Um, and that's sort of fine and well and good in the United States, maybe, where they do lots of very rigorous testing and, and weapons reviews. But not all countries do those kinds of reviews. Uh, and and they, there's no standards, even if you accept that. So really, the, the, those who are advocating against a prohibition are, are arguing in favor of soft law promulgation of best practices and, and these kinds of standards. And this is really what the DOD uh, has a directive that they issued in 2012 on how to handle autonomous weapon systems within the Department of Defense. And basically, it just requires extra reviews and ensures that you know high-level people sign off on it uh, and that it is protected against various faults and things like that. Um, so whether those are suitable standards or whether those could be effectively implemented is a huge question. Um, <clears throat> and it doesn't really create any kind of prohibition or, or norm, and that's really where, where I think it, it falls short. Uh, the bigger question, I think, is really this accountability gap that is created by these kinds of systems. Because even though a commander is somehow ultimately responsible, um, in any actual situation, if the robot does something that it shouldn't have done, who's responsible? Well, it might be it was a software failure and the manufacturers or the engineers are somehow responsible. The person who deployed the system might be responsible. It could have just been a technical glitch or some unexpected environmental situation. And what you really end up with is uh, a lack uh, of accountability for the consequences. And, and already within warfare, there's a huge <laughs> lack of accountability, right? So it's possible to convict people of war crimes, but you have to have very high standards of you know, mens rea, so guilty mind in the committing of a war crime. <clears throat> These would be the perfect alibis, uh, right? So you'd never have any intention. You don't know what the system's really going to do. You wanted it to you know, take a village. You didn't know it was going to kill all the villagers. Um, so you're not really kind of legally responsible. Um, there's all kinds of practical reasons why you might not want these things. They could be hacked, spoofed. Uh, they could start unintended conflicts or escalate conflicts. All kinds of unpredictable results, like the flash crash or the stock market. Arms races and regional instability. These can proliferate to non-state actors, terrorist organizations. Um, <clears throat> and then I think there's this whole set of moral reasons which come down to human dignity. And do we really want to allow machines the authority to decide life and death questions. Uh, and, and ultimately, the removal of human rights or the overriding of human rights. Uh, and these systems, if we can get them banned at the international level, it's more likely that we can regulate them at police forces and civil uses, because actually an international treaty wouldn't cover police uses. Um, so you, tyrants could still use them against demonstrators. Um, and so some of my work is focused on where the sort of decision to take a human life actually requires a kind of a, a true moral agent and some level of moral reasoning uh, that right now only a human can satisfy. And there's also kind of utilitarian and consequentialist arguments that these could just like lead to lots of bad consequences. Um, so there's nothing that explicitly prohibits autonomous weapons in current law, so we do need new law. Uh, waiting to see what happens is not really the best strategy because all of the, once these systems get deployed, uh, the militaries will become dependent on them, so it'll be much harder to regulate them after that. Uh, and what we really want is a clear and strong norm like meaningful human control that doesn't get down to the necessarily the technical nitty gritty. Um, and human rights and dignity are a good ones. So I'll briefly summarize so we have some time for questions. So I think you know the big challenges 
it varies depending on your kind of regulatory framework. Um, but innovation really needs regulation. So there's a lot of people who are terrified of regulation. But without any kind of regulatory framework, whether it's self-driving cars or drones or anything else, companies also don't know what their liabilities are, what their responsibilities are. So I think it's very hard to enter a market of, say, a self-driving car right now, although Tesla is boldly going forth and says they're going to release self-driving cars functionality by summer. Um, it's not clear you know, what, what's going to happen when, when there's accidents, who's, who's going to insure that, how is the risk going to be redistributed, who's, what the liabilities are going to be. Um, if you have regulatory agencies, how do you avoid regulatory capture, things like that. Uh, how do you include civil society and public interest in these kind of stakeholder decisions, especially if you're talking about systems that are being designed uh, by engineers remotely, uh, deep within companies that are obscured. And there's a kind of, uh, I think ultimately what my angle is, is to really focus on how do we develop norms? Like what are the social norms that we want to see realized in these technologies? And how do we do that in a way that keeps pace with or, or stays ahead of the development of actual technological capability? I think that's the real challenge. And it's a bit of a catch-22 because you don't necessarily know what the technological capabilities are until one, they're, they're invented, and two, they actually get taken up in the society and you see how they get used. And we can see this with the internet. We couldn't predict all the ways that the internet would be used in 1990. Um, and yet, we, we have to sort of think about what norms we want to see there. Um, but both are emergent, and so I think we have to look at them that way and, and make sure that they're in dialogue with each other, the technological capability and the norms. Um, and patchwork regulation is kind of frustrating, but I think it's necessary. I don't think you can have a single regulatory agency that spans the vast complexity of all these different domains. Um, so I'll just open it up for questions.